We are with Marsha Hunt, co-star of the film Actors in Sin. And my gosh, Marsha, it's hard to believe when we go over your acting career, it goes back into the mid-1930s when you first were a contract player at Paramount. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, in your wildest dreams, conceive that that seventy something years later we'd be sitting here talking about a film that you did almost fifty eight years ago? No, I was so busy with the presence, the amazing, unbelievable presence of whatever it was, June of nineteen thirty five, when all of a sudden a seventeen year old would be actress was under contract to Paramount Pictures and placed right into her first movie and playing the lead, the romantic lead, in her the first time she ever got paid to act in a feature film shown around the world. And there was no training for movies of any kind available then. I don't think the schools, I don't think academia took uh, movies seriously yet. And now I don't think there's a college or a university that doesn't have some kind of film course. And uh, so now it's respectable. Marsha coming to Paramount, uh, and you get your first movie role at Paramount in 1935. The Virginia Judge is the title that was given uh, a series of uh, vaudeville sketches that a lovely old gentleman uh, named Walter C. Kelly uh, was famous for in vaudeville. He was very much, his work was like Will Rogers, homespun philosophy with a lot of humor. And uh, Paramount stitched together a lot of his sketches into a screenplay, wrote in a love story for his, I think his, I was his niece, probably orphaned or something, anyhow, living with my uncle, the Virginia judge, and with two leading men one of whom was Robert Cummings. And uh, so I was Mary Lou from Virginia, and I had to learn the Virginia sound. Margaret Sullivan was shooting So Red the Rose on another sound stage at Paramount. They called them sound stages because sound was still fairly new. And I was sent over to meet Miss Sullivan, who was from Virginia, and to ask her how a Virginian sounded so that was my first meeting with someone I later worshipped as an actress. And the two leading men, one was Bob Cummings, the other uh, Johnny Downs, who had been an our gang comedy child actor, very handsome and uh, a very good dancer. He later did a lot of dance numbers and Paramount musicals with um, Eleanor Whitney, who was the fastest tap dancer in the world. As opposed to Eleanor Powell. Who was who the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if, oh, step and fetch it. That wonderful, legendary black actor who moved slowly and had a wonderful style and was later criticized as an Uncle Tom uh, nigger actor. I thought he was wonderful. He knew what he was doing. He was a very sharp, nice man. And uh, I was thrilled to be working with step and fetch it. I don't think he sold his race down at all. There were bright people of all colors. It wasn't anti-black, but some people thought it was. When you think of black actors, you think of Eddie Anderson, and, and so many people, art imitating life, say that how could Jack Benny treat Eddie Anderson as Jack Benny was to Rochester, and how could he treat him like that? And what, what people didn't realize was Eddie Anderson was paid a lot of money by Jack Benny, was very wealthy, was a wonderful actor, did things other than the Rochester character, yeah. but, but that was the culture then, you know, other than porters or, or bellboys or whatever, there really weren't significant roles for, for people of color in those days. No, and uh, a, a character slow-witted or whatever uh, is simply that person not a depiction of a whole race of people. And uh, we have all kinds of people with lighter skin, and nobody says that's an attack on whites. No. So we progressed. Eddie Robinson, 
actors and sing, Dan O'Hurley. You you would work with Eddie before. You would work with Eddie, if I'm not mistaken, at MGM. Very, yeah, at a very underrated film called Unholy Partners with uh, with with Edward Arnold. And, and you actually got to sing and dance in that film too. I don't think I danced. I okay. sang. Okay. But there was a great arrangement of uh, an old standard called After You've Gone, uh, arranged by Al Siegel, who is responsible, I think, for Ethel Merman. He kind of discovered her and coached her into projecting her particular style. And Al was at MGM, and they had him do a, <coughs> a real write-out arrangement of uh, After You've Gone which I loved doing. I have sung in six movies, and nobody thought it was me. They assumed that if I could sing, I would be a singer, and I was an actress. But I love music. I love singing. Yeah, um, Unholy Partners, as I recall, was the, the history of the tabloid newspaper, the half-sized newspaper. And it was prompted, of course, by writers on subways, you can't open a newspaper without hitting somebody to the right or left of you because subways are so crowded. And uh, the tabloid, the half-sized newspaper, was apparently born at the time and in, consistent with the storyline of Unholy Partners. But Eddie G was so, that's my nickname for him, I don't mean disrespect, but great fondness. I just love this man. He was unlike the sinister powerhouse uh, tough guy character that that uh, was there in so many of his films at, at Warner's. This was one of the most outgoing, delightful, witty, highly cultured, darling men. And we liked each other. In fact, somewhere I have a picture taken on the set of Unholy Partners. <clears throat> in which I, my sister visiting me, the only time she ever came on the set of any movie I did was visiting that day. Mervyn Leroy directed the picture, and, uh, uh, and I, the three of us, are sitting on a couch laughing away at Eddie, who, cigar in hand, is dancing some sort of jig, and one knee is up as high as his face, <laughs> and, and we're all laughing our heads off. It's a wonderful picture. And so far from the public concept of Edward G. Robinson, it, it, it almost held menace when you heard that name. And he was a lovely guy. Well, and his real name was not Edward G. Robinson, as we all know, it was Emmanuel Goldenberg. That's right. From I Romania. I remember that, yeah. When, when you first found out about Actors in Sin, you know, what were some of your thoughts? Because it was unusual uh, to do a film Indeed. in those days, although it, it really started a trend. Fox later on did a, a, a film called O. Henry's Full House with five little vignettes based on O. Henry's stories with uh -huh. five different casts and five different directors. Um, in, in this particular film, it, it's two uh, different casts, two different stories. What, talk about how you felt in, in finding out about you know, getting the role in this unique type of concept. Well, of course, anything new is exciting and especially interesting. I knew Ben Hecht uh, socially. He was a great friend of Charlie Lederer, who was a fine screenwriter, who was married to my then best friend, Anne Shirley. And uh, I would meet Ben Hecht every now and then at their home. And uh, he was a colorful man. Um, there was a, a presence about him that, that had great energy and fun. And um, I remember the mad crush he had on Marilyn Monroe. Uh, Anne quoted him, and she said, this tough guy, this, this man of the world, she said, you won't believe when he finally met Marilyn Monroe, he sounded like a schoolboy. He said, did anybody ever tell you that you are beautiful? Beautiful. And he, he sounded like a, a, what, a sophomore with a crush. But Ben was many people and uh, a darling to be around, colorful, interesting, congenial. And when he came to me with Actors and Sin, the composite title 
of two other titles, uh, Actors, uh, Actors' Blood, which is the name of the story I was in, a drama mystery about the stage, about the theater, and Concerning a Woman of Sin, which is a right out farce comedy about uh, dramatic radio put together into one feature length film. I couldn't wait. It sounded fascinating. I didn't know that we would shoot our whole short story, our half of the film, in two days. Can you believe that? I don't know how we did it, but we did. It was done on a shoestring. Everybody was paid minimum. And um, I think there were really three characters, Eddie would be Robinson and Dan O'Hurley, whose maybe first movie it was in America. And he came to us from uh, a very distinguished career in the theater in Ireland. But nobody yet knew his name. He also did a, a couple of films in, in, in England and Ireland as well. I think the most important film that he made was a film called Odd Man Out. Before? Before, yeah. Ours. I didn't know he had done any films. I just knew about the theater. But Dan was uh, also a presence. Uh, I knew without anybody telling me that this was uh, a man of stature as an actor and a thorough pro at what he did. I, interestingly, after we shot the film, I can't tell you how long afterward, a man called me on the phone and uh, introduced himself as a, I forget, I think producer, it could have been director, either of those. Uh, he was about to shoot Robinson Crusoe as a feature film and was considering Dan O'Hurley. And knowing that I had worked with Dan, he said he wanted the frankest possible appraisal of Dan because whoever carried this one man character, he was the film, had to really be able to carry the weight of a film on his own shoulders. And what could I tell him? Well, I was happy to give Dan O'Hurley a rave review. And some time later, Dan made Robinson Crusoe. And if I'm not mistaken, he got an Academy Award nomination for it. He did, and lost to Ernest Borgnine for Marty. There we are. I don't remember the year. 1955. Ah. You're my reference <laughs> library. <laughs> No, I was delighted and secretly very proud. I don't think I ever told Dan, who became a friend. He and his family uh, would have my husband, Robert, and me over for a lot of visits uh, just off the ocean. They lived in a, a wonderful hill overlooking the Pacific. We had some great times. And then I ran across Dan doing radio, dramatic radio, uh, in recent years, right up until he left us. Wonderful man. In Actors in Sin, you had a, a very unique role, Marsha. Well, I had the role of somebody named Marsha, but spelled traditionally, um, who was a very temperamental actress who'd been at the top a while and was very nervous about fading. And who is found dead on her own bed beneath a portrait, an oil portrait of her that has been savagely slashed. So it looks like a violent death. And the rest of the film is spent finding out how and why Marsha Tillyou, was my name, died. Well, because the film was shot on a shoestring, uh, Ben Heck didn't want to have to pay for an oil portrait to be done of me, which would then be slashed and cut to ribbon. And somehow I heard the problem, and I told him that there was an oil portrait of me at my house. It was more a caricature than a glamorous likeness, but you could tell who it was because of the long neck and, and the hairstyle I was wearing at the time. And so he borrowed my oil portrait, which is life-size, big one. And all of my friends who saw the movie gasped with horror when they saw that oil portrait 
with big slashes cut in it. And then, of course, I had to break the news to them that the portrait I had was still hanging in my home and that they had made a life-size photograph of the, the oil painting and slashed the photograph. But it gave them some anxious moments. Secrets revealed. <laughs> then, yeah, I guess, had a little more budget time for Woman of Sin. They spent a lot more time on that one, didn't they? Yeah, they spent half again as much. Concerning a Woman of Sin took three whole days. And I think that's because Jenny Hecht, Ben's daughter, had never acted before. So that took a day longer. The whole film then, the two short stories together, took five days to shoot. Still some kind of a record, I think. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Did she ever act again, Jenny? Not to my knowledge. Well, nepotism, ne nepotism still lives. <laughs> the second segment of Actors in Sin uh, starred Eddie Albert. Did you know him much then? I didn't know Eddie Albert well then, but I certainly did later. Over the years, we became acquainted while he was married during his whole very happy marriage to Margot. And they were a splendid couple. Margot did a great many important things culturally for uh, the Mexican population of Los Angeles. And uh, Eddie was one worthy cause after another. But he was, I think, the, the earliest green actor, meaning... An, uh, an environmentalist. He had growing in his front yard in a very fashionable neighborhood a corn field. With, and you know that line from Oklahoma, the corn is as high as an elephant's eye? Well, full, wonderful stalks of corn grew in his front yard. He thought that if you had land, you should use it and produce food. But uh, Eddie, in his very last couple of years, invited me twice over to his house, and it was quite a distance from my home, to lunch. He just wanted some conversation. And we talked of, I don't know, hundreds of things. We had a lot of mutual interests. Eddie introduced me to Meals for Millions, which was a, a, a powdered form of very highly nutritious uh, <clears throat> food for um, for poor countries. If you could stir that powdered material into any broth or even water, you would get your day's need of nutrition. And Eddie was a, a great spokesman for that. I wound up later on, on the board of directors of Meals for Millions. So we were associated in causes. We cared about world hunger and... Uh, he very much on the environment. He was a great man, our Eddie. I love your story about his farm and his corn stalks as high as an elephant's eye. And boy, isn't that a matter of life imitating art or art imitating life that he gets the role of Green Acres, the, you know, as, a, <laughs> as Oliver Wendell Douglas, yeah. uh, the city lawyer who goes out and starts a farm with Ava Gabor. It could well have been Eddie's own idea to put that on the screen, to influence people. He was a very smart fellow. Eddie told me when we worked in another film together, which was Smash Up with Susan Hayward, Lee Bowman. Great film, that won Susan Hayward an Academy Award nomination. It was quite a film, it's shown endlessly on television. But Eddie told me that during World War II, he, was, he found himself alone in the ocean trying to stay afloat. And I don't know how many hours he was struggling to stay above water. But he said he made a pact with his God that if he was somehow miraculously saved, he would spend the rest of his living days trying to do good for his fellow man. And this is exactly what happened. And he made good his promise. He was quite a man, our Eddie Albert. Yeah. You, when people look over your career, I think two things come to mind, and, and 
I really want to give you the opportunity to set the record straight because, number one, um, a lot of people say that you were a victim uh, of the blacklist, of the Hollywood blacklist. And that really wasn't true, was it? Yes and no. I was indeed a victim of the blacklist because I was prevented from doing what I loved most and what I'd gotten very good at, acting in film. Yes, the blacklist virtually ended my film career. But to be a victim for life because of the blacklist is far from true. It gave me something I'd never had, free time. And as the fates would have it, I turned out not to be a mother. I failed at several tries at motherhood and had one a premature daughter who only lived a day. So apparently I was not meant to for motherhood. And what happened with that free time I had was that I discovered the outside world, what was beyond the sound stages of shooting movies. And it was the most wonderful discovery of my life. I went around the world in 1955 with my husband, Robert, and I came back a planet patriot. I fell in love with the human race and that there was a lot more to be caring about beyond America's borders. You know, I was brought up to be patriotic. And the flag is going salute. And tear up when you hear the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, sure, but that's not all of it. And I came home determined to learn more about something called the United Nations that I knew really virtually nothing about until that trip around the world. And then I gave the next 25 years of my life to serving the UN in any way I could. What fascinated me most was not the political or the uh, war peace part of the UN, but the 85% of the UN, which is the specialized agencies who are doing miraculous things about world health, food and agriculture, uh, UNESCO, education, science and culture, all under one agency's name. Well, there are 30-some of these agencies working throughout the world to coordinate efforts and make a better, peaceful world. Now, what could be more important or valuable than that? I wound up in 1960 producing a documentary film to illustrate and emphasize World Refugee Year that the United Nations declared. I got 14 very good stars to donate their services to tell the story of refugees because I knew if you put refugees in the title, people would not want to see that documentary film. But with Bing Crosby, with Paul Newman, with Harry Belafonte, with, uh, oh, with just 14 gorgeous talents telling those stories, it was effective. And it felt awfully good to to spread the knowledge and the grasp of the immense value and importance of the UN. So there went part of my life that was pure joy, spreading hopeful tidings around the world, and uh, that I probably would not have done had I gone on acting in film. I discovered the live theater. I did plays, six of them on Broadway, and oh, between 25 and 30, in stock all around, I don't know, in about several dozen states. How rewarding all this was because of the blacklist. So in a weird way, though I'm certainly not pleased that it happened to me and it was a tragic thing for everyone it affected, it enabled me to live a fuller life and to work at some things that I certainly didn't end, like hunger and homelessness and all that, but it felt good to work toward conquering those things. So, no victim, I. Marcia, there's, there's always been this, this uh, perception that you were this far away from becoming a major film star. But the truth is uh, that, with especially at MGM, that there was uh, very little difference between the A film and the B film. You could have a B film like uh, Kid Glove Killer, which was directed by Fred Zinnemann, 
had A people in it, and in at MGM especially, a lot of A actors did B films, a lot of B actors did A films. It was just the way it was. No, there's, I think, an overemphasis today on A picture, B picture. We who were making both, first one and then another, didn't pay that much attention. Uh, Cape Love Killer, for instance, it was a brilliant script, wonderfully written. Another picture would not be termed an A picture was made with Margaret O'Brien and James Craig and, and me. The most enchanting script, both MGM film. Metro had the top writers, composers, designers, film editors, the best talent they could find. And it showed in all the films. MGM films had a luster about them of excellence. I was so proud to be a part of Metro Films, as indeed I was originally at Paramount, which had just about as gorgeous an array of stars. Uh, you know, Cary Grant, Fred McMurray, Ray Milland, Carol Lombard, Mae West, uh, W.C. Fields, Bing Crosby. Every Crosby film paid the rent. If the other films didn't make a dime, a Crosby film made a fortune. I was so privileged to be in the company of people of that stature and of that brilliant talent. So no, the B picture as now looked down on was simply a feature motion picture that didn't have as big a budget or as lustrous star names as uh, those others. But I was in both. I'd go from one to the other, and I, it didn't matter that much to me which it was. I, I always thought that there were so many uh, directors who, when given a lower budget film, did more with it than they did when they got their hands on a bigger budget film. You know, uh, yeah. now I don't want to diminish like a guy like Fred Zinneman, who I think his films were consistent from his B work to his A work. But Kid Glove Killer was Fred Zinneman's first feature film after doing shorts for MGM. A, a fellow like Robert Wise, who was a film editor at RKO in the Val Luton unit, had some great B oh. films come out yeah. uh, and, and did well with, with A features as well. Uh, it, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder, I've always felt. Uh, you, could have, you could have great Bs and lousy As and great, lousy Bs and great As. It happens both ways. You're you're a nanogenarian. I don't think I don't think you mind me saying that. Oh, I'm proud of it. And and you're now involved. I mean, just to show what kind of woman you are, okay? And, and you're not just sitting around. Uh, in your 90s, you're now involved with record producing. I mean, you just <laughs> keep moving forward. Tell us about it. Well, I grew up. My childhood and my teens were in those magic decades, the 30s and 40s, that are now called the Great American Songbook. I grew up learning for life those great melodies and lyrics from Broadway shows and just popular songs that stand today alone. They haven't ever been topped and rarely equaled. And I'm afraid I tuned out when rock came in. It was noise. It was defiant and shrill, raucous, rough. And that was against my own nature and my whole history of, of song. So if I have a mission today, it's to try to help push back, I mean, push forward uh, the quality of melody and thoughtful, witty, charming lyrics. So when I came across a voice that was so beautiful, I think one of the best male voices I've ever heard, uh, I put it together with the Paige Cavanaugh trio. And Paige had six decades of really brilliant, stylish piano playing, very individual. So I put them and Tony London, this singer with a beautiful voice, together in an album of really very romantic songs. And the album is called Songs from the Heart. And uh, it's out there. 
it's, uh, it's only available at the moment on something called CD Baby, but uh, they're selling copies. And to this extent, it feels very good to do my share as best I can to remind or even introduce people about beautiful melodies and songs. Rock and the, the heavy beat, they have their place in a culture, but so does gentleness and compassion and inspiration and comfort and, and uh, a sense of loss, a sense of discovery, of love. All of these take melodies, take telling lyrics that will stay with you the rest of your life. I want them back. I want young people to learn about the gentle part of life. So look at me, the record producer. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? Not really. It's you, pioneer.